So take this heart, Lord. I'll be your vessel. Welcome to the teaching ministry of Reverend JFK Mensah, a seasoned Bible teacher with over 40 years of ministry experience. He is a pastor, a church planter, a missionary, and an international conference speaker. He is passionate about making Christ-like disciples worldwide. JFK Mensah is the General Overseer of Great Commission Church International. May you be transformed as you listen to the Word of God. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for the way you ushered us into 2019. We give you our hearts and our lives. Our prayer is that this year we shall see more of your faithfulness and walk closer to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well, as the secretary told you, our goal for this year is that every member of this church will be a Christ-like reproducing disciple maker so that we shall be 100 strong by the end of 2019. That is our goal for the year. So all the topics for the sermon have been crafted to help us get there. So we have broken the year into four. And we are taking for this quarter Christ likeness. Then the second quarter we are taking discipleship and disciple making. And then the third quarter we are working on um, leadership, Christian leadership. And then the final quarter, God willing, we shall be handling excellence in ministry. Excellence in ministry. So, this means I am introducing the topic of Christ likeness today. <coughs> and I want to start by defining Christ likeness. The reason we define the words we use is because the two of you can be talking, but the words you are using you both understand the words differently. So, your friend is calling you on the mobile phone, and you say, oh, I am, I am home. And yet, the home you are talking about is different from the home he is thinking of. So, he takes a tuba <coughs> and rushes, and he thought he was, you were in your mother's home, but you were with your daddy. That you were you called both home. So this is the reason why whenever there is a word or an idea or a concept, we need to define it to tell what it is and what it is not, so that we can all be on the same platform. So what do we really mean by Christ life? Let me start with the working definition we are going to use. Christ likeness is the process of cooperating with God's Spirit and God's Word and God's agents to transform you into the perfect image of Jesus Christ. 
Let me come again. Christ likeness is the process of cooperating with God's spirit, God's word, God's agents to transform you into the perfect image of Jesus Christ. Now, let me begin to break this down. Number one thing to notice is that it's a process. It's not a one-day thing. In fact, to get the idea that you can become holy in one day, you can become like Jesus in one day, is to deceive yourself. It never works. It never works. Because even Jesus grew. Luke chapter 2 verse 40 says that, and the baby Jesus grew. He was full of wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2 52, he says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 and 9 says that though Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So, Christ likeness is a process. In fact, 2 Corinthians 3 18 says, We all, with unveiled open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, even by the Spirit of Galatians 4.19 says, My little children in whom I travail, I labor, till Christ be formed in you. And Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, that I planted Apollo's water, and God gave the increase of the growth. Uh, Ephesians 4.15 he says, speaking the truth in love, we should grow up into the head who is Christ. I hope I have made the point. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you get the idea that you can just one day be like Jesus, you, you are on the, wrong, on, the, on the wrong side. But some other people too teach that you can never be like Jesus. They are also wrong. You see, many people, including pastors, they say, we are not we are human beings. We are not perfect. Eh? We, eh, I'm, I'm also a human being. And they, yes, we are human beings. But the scripture is clear that God's desire for man is that we should be in the very image of Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 Paul says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, till we present every man perfect in Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4, from verse one, uh, 11 all the way to verse 13. He says, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, <coughs> to maturity, even the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. Now, having said that, I want us to go back and trace the history of man. 
In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And he said, So in the image of God created he man, male and female created he them. In the image and likeness of God. So, from the very beginning, God desired that man should be his image and likeness. Now, it is not only the image and likeness of God that we see. We also see God trying to you know, give commandments to man to be perfect. We, we need to examine what happened. When God put man in the garden of Eden, he told him, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, all the fruits, but of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should eat. The day you eat, you will surely die. And serpent, Satan took serpent and deceived our first grandmother Eve. And she ate and gave to the husband Adam and he ate. So, with that eating, the nature of God inside us was broken like a mirror. And the nature of Satan and sin was planted inside him. In fact, in the very next chapter, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Let's read Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Let's read Genesis 6, 5 and 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God saw that every imagination of man was only evil continually. So when you get up, the first thought that comes in your mind is how to chase a girl, then how to abort a pregnancy, how to envy somebody, how to steal somebody's mobile phone, how to uh, quarrel with somebody. Hey, I, I'm, playing, I'm just planning, if I get, get that one, I'm insulted. Yeah, she doesn't know me. The, so uh, the, the taxi driver wants to cheat the client. And every imagination of the thoughts of the heart of man was only evil continuum. Yes, verse 6. Verse 6 says, And the Lord was so mm. that he had made man of the earth, mm. and it grieved him to his heart. It pained God that he had made man of the earth. It, it, you know, the first time I read this thing, I wept. I told myself, Father, I want to be one human being. You are not sorry you are created. You see? It pained God. You, can you feel it? That you are moving on the earth, and it's a paining God that he created you. It's pain in so, ah, <coughs> Look at them. Look at them. In fact, after he destroyed this earth with flood, <coughs> Genesis 8, 21, let's read it. He said, I will never destroy the earth again because of man's sin and wickedness. Genesis because, chapter 8, verse 21. Because I have seen that from his youth. This is how he is. If I want to keep on destroying this earth, I'll, I'll finish, I'll do it again and again. Because that, yes. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Mm. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Jeremiah 17, 9 
says that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. One of the versions says incurably bad. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Yes. I'm reading from the ESV. And it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Mm. Who can understand it? I like that. Desperately sick. You see? Desperately wicked and bad and rotten. Do you have any other version there? Uh, Yes, the NIV says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Ah, <coughs> you see, what it is saying is that you can't save yourself because you are beyond cure. You, you are rotten beyond cure. Can you can do you ima- can you imagine man created in the image of God has been degenerated and is so bad that he is beyond cure. He is just you know, uh, yes, you know, sometimes, yes, sometimes your car has an accident and you say, oh, no, you take it to the feet I did. But sometimes you write it off. Yes, because the way the crash has come, you cannot repair it. Bible says man is irreparably depraved, beyond cure. This is where we have got to. See, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, all the way to it. He says, There's none righteous, no, not one, not even one person fears God. You can't, everybody, even their best, is, is filled with another agenda. You see a girl, so oh, sister, I want to pay your school fees. Hey, so there's nobody, hey, but he's not just paying school fees, he's going to collect. <laughs> you see, so we, we you see people who are kind, who are generous, but if you were to go and see the secret agenda behind the goodness they are exercising, you will ask yourself, mm. you know. So God devised a plan to restore man back. Not only to the original image of God, but better. Mm-hmm. You see? So Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that God demonstrates his love towards us. In the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in this death, he took our sins. Second Corinthians 5 21. He who knew no sin. God made him to be sin for us. He took our curses because Galatians 3.13 says that Jesus became a curse for us because it is written, curse is anyone who is hung on a tree that the blessing of God will come. He took our diseases and sicknesses. Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 says himself took our sicknesses and carried our diseases. Then the broken relationship between us and God, <coughs> He came to repair it. Not only that, He came to change our hearts. Because even if He pays for all this and He doesn't change the machine which works sin within us, we will continue to be like that. So Ezekiel 36. Verse 25 to 27, he says that I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will take the heart of stone out of you and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my commandments. This is the only way to heal an incurably sick heart. And Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 and 11 is even sweeter. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. 
I will write my laws on their hearts and put it in their minds. I will be their God. They will be my people. Nobody will tell his neighbor, no, no, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now tell me, once you have a new heart and a new spirit, a God's spirit in you to cause you to walk according to his plans, and he engraves his commandments on your heart and puts it in your mind. What prevents you now from becoming like Christ? This is it. You see, God is in a giant restoration program. Let's read the first Corinthians 15 from verse 45 to 49. I hope it's making sense. Is it? Okay. We are reading the first Corinthians 15 from verse 45. To 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 to 49. Yes. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The first man, Adam, was made from the dust, and he became a living soul. Yes. The last Adam became... The last Adam, who is Jesus? He is the last Adam, because God doesn't want to create any more Adams. So he created... He, Jesus is the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. He became a life-giving spirit. Yes. But it is not the spiritual that is first, Correct. but the natural and then the spiritual. Yes. The first man was from the earth. The first, yes. A man of dust. The first man, God took dust, eh? molded man, and breathed into his nostrils. Yes. The second man is from heaven. Wow! This new species of man is from where? Heaven. Heaven. It's not from dust. As, from, yes. as was the man of dust. As was the man of dust. So also are those who are of the dust. You didn't write a, 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 a permission letter eh, to our application letter to Adam to be like him. You were born a sinner because you are Adam's race. <laughs> and as is the man of heaven, as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. In the same way, when you accept Christ as Lord and personal Savior, you don't have to write an application letter to heaven to give you the things that make heavenly man. Tell your sister, heavenly man, heavenly man, heavenly woman, heavenly woman, heavenly woman. You see, the Bible is saying that the first man was made from the dust, and you took after him without any permission. The second man is from heaven, not from dust. And the same way, you take after him. Verse 49. Yes. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Good. we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. You need to understand, when you are reading the Bible, you need to understand that the giant program of man, of God, is to move man from the garden of Eden from being a man of dust, from being a, 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 a fallen, lowly man, into a heavenly city, Jerusalem, and giving him a man of heaven, woman of heaven. <coughs> this is the giant program of God. So when we fell, he quickly put a plan into place that a virgin would conceive. And bear a son, and we shall call his name Jesus. And that this Jesus, he is the heavenly man. And in him, just like in Adam, we all die, in him, you all live. So sin and death came through the first Adam. But resurrection from the dead and life comes through the second Adam. When you were only in the first Adam, only sin and death were you. Now you have moved into the last Adam. The second man. Therefore, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
now works to free you from the law of sin and death that was working in the first hour. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we, I want to explain that in my first reading of the Bible, I was shocked by Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. God came to Abraham and said, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be perfect. Some of the Bible verses say, Blameless. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. You see, I said, What? God wants us to walk before him and be blameless. Ah, how can we? Then Deuteronomy 18, verse 13. He says, you shall be perfect or blameless before the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 13. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. I said, what? Uh, uh, what? Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45. He said, you shall be holy because I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So, you know, at first I was shocked. Then I saw that Bible men in the Old Testament, they didn't have the full Bible. They didn't have Jesus. They didn't have the Holy Spirit baptism. They didn't have church with apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But Enoch walked with God 300 years and God took him to heaven without seeing death. And Elijah walked with God, and God sent a chariot, you know, this V8 eh, limousine from heaven to come and pick him, take him to heaven. Those two people in the Old Testament told me that no, this is not, the thing is not an impossible uh, standard. Old Testament. Then about five different people in the Old Testament people, the Old Testament to chariot. One is Abraham. He is called the friend of God. Mm. And God came and ate in his house. Mm. Genesis 18. Then another person is Moses. He said that Moses, God spoke with him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. I said, what? Then David, God said, I found a man after my own heart. Acts 13, 22. You see? I said, what? These are human beings. You see? And they didn't have the things we have, the privileges we have. And another man who bamboozles me is Joe. We have the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. We are resisting the Holy Spirit power and see. Joe didn't have all these things. But God bragged about him before Satan. He's a blameless and perfect man. Nobody like him. This is Old Testament. When you come to the New Testament, it's worse. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Luke 6, 36, be merciful, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Uh, Ephesians 4, 32, he says, forgive us God in Christ forgave you. Jesus said in John 15, verse 9 and 12, He said, just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Love one another just as I have loved you. And then, of course, First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, He says, you should be holy because your Father is holy. Now, Ephesians 5 says, be imitators of God as 
dear children. You are like, ah, what are you saying? But that's about God. Look at those things about Jesus. First John chapter 2, verse 6. He says, anybody who says he abides in Christ should walk as Jesus walked. First John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, anyone who has this hope that when you see Jesus, we shall be like him. You purify yourself just as Jesus is pure. That's John. Then Peter. Oh, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 21, 22, that this is why you have been called. Christ suffered for us. Live here as an example. That you should walk in his steps. In his steps. Who did no sin? Neither was God found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he didn't insult back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten him. Then what about Paul? <laughs> Paul? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Not even Christ, me. Because I'm imitating Christ so closely that just imitate me, you will be imitating Jesus. Hmm. Now, these were human beings. They were not angels. So if they were able to live and speak this way, then God is serious when he says that. It is his desire to change us progressively into the image of Jesus. And this transformation can happen if you and I cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Cooperating with him means believe the promises of God. Cooperating with him means take hold of the grace of God that is in Christ Jesus. Cooperating with him means having your daily quiet time. Cooperating with him means, you know, finding a mentor, a disciple, somebody who is, whose Christian life is better and stronger than yours, and moving with him so that Proverbs 27, 17, that iron sharpens iron will happen in your life. Then you see that you are growing. You are growing. You are growing. And as you grow, you begin to see yourself closer and closer to Jesus. The average Christian now is used to going to church just sitting down, seeing the choir perform, and then hearing a sermon and saying, how nice, going back home and being the same. So 2018, 2017, when you look back, you can't see any spiritual growth at all in yourself. You look at your life and you're like, I'm just like I was, Titi <laughs> You see? And the worst is people who have been Christian for a long time. They have entered into a, a, a bus we call complacency. You see? Because you are, you are not grown, you, you, you don't even know you are not grown, and you are satisfied with the fact that you are not grown. Then they tell you, what kind of thing man will see before? <laughs> All this, you are jumping around and shouting, leading worship. I've done before. I've done before. You wait. After five years, you'll be tired of it. <laughs> you see, because you have lost it. You see, God's purpose never was that you should reach a point in your Christianity and you are not growing again. He said you should be like this. If you are not like him, you haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. So Paul says, I press on. I press on. And he, when I read Paul's accounts, I say he's got it. He was able to say in Philippians 1.21, for me, to live is Christ. To die is him. He's got it. You see? Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7. He said, the things which were gained to me, I count them lost, that I will win and gain Christ. And I consider everything else as rubbish, you know, bola, zula, so that I can lay hold of Jesus. He's got it. He's got it. And he talked about his converts in Galatians. He says, my little children, I travel till Christ be formed in you. He's got it. Why is the average Christian in church not growing? And why don't we care? That's the most difficult part. It's like snake is biting you and you don't care. You know? Or your, your leg is in fire and it's burning you don't care. It means you are dead. 
See? And because we, we don't value Christ like this, very few Christians ever manage to do what God sent them to this earth to come and do. Because you need a certain maturity level to be able to function. You see, this is Dr. Evans. Mm -hmm. eh? Tell us, when you went to uh, Indonesia, how many, uh, Philippines, sorry, how many years did you do the medical course before you graduated? Uh, in fact, for me, it was a little bit reduced, but it was four years. Okay. But the prerequisite is that you must do first four, de four years degree. Yes. As a prayer, so that you know that is eight years, so, but if it's SS, then mm -hmm. you go the six years. You finish this degree mm -hmm. here, four years, before going there to do another four years to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Japan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Japan. Yes. Yes. Supposing you have stopped at year two of your medical school, can you practice as a doctor? Yes. Tell us the truth. Mm -hmm. What about a lawyer? You are in the second year, you stop. Can you practice as a lawyer? No. Eh? No. Why? You see, Christianity, we, a lot of the believers lose out because you go to form one with Jesus, form two, form three, then you stop. <laughs> and you are so happy and satisfied with yourself that you look around and say, oh, oh these people, they are not Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you two, you haven't gotten to the place where you can practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see? So you look through the our churches. Look through our churches. They look up to the church members. They are born again, but dead. Because there is, there is no fire in them. You can see that this person has been a Christian. He's really born again. But there is nothing of the fire which was in him when you were born again. You see, at least uh, my wife is here, Mama Joyce too is here. We used to walk from Legon mm. to Medina for all nights, every Friday. And what? If I see students, and walk back. Why? Fire! Then, as you grow, <laughs> as you grow, you see your, your car like an articulator is making wow, wow, wow. The time comes and the fire goes out. But you also go to church. <laughs> then you tell people, hey, the way we go, this Christianity, we have, we have done some before. <laughs> oh, you don't know, you people, you ask for what? You never graduated to be a practicing, ministering Christian in Christ. Because you stop at form two, form three. He can't use you as a doctor. He can't use you as a lawyer. He can't use you as a nurse. He can't use because you stop somewhere and plateaued and died. You beaten out. That's what's happening. Christ likeness means you are going to continue this process and march on with him and move on. And you you every year you must add on. You see, every year you must grow you must, until you come to a place where you begin ministry. <laughs> and people can see fruit. You see? So Jesus says, any branch in me who doesn't bear fruit, my father cuts it. So a lot of Christians are cut off because you are in Christ. But there is nothing real showing life. You see? Then, you see other people too. You can see fruitfulness. And the fruitfulness is the conscience which shows that you are alive. You are alive. You are alive. You are on the road. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, it's exciting to finish your medical course. Is it not true? Yes. It's always very exciting. Why is it that when we finish secondary school, you are just singing? <laughs> Results have not come, but look, you see, it's the final year now. You see, when you finish your last paper, you say, eh, hooray. Why? Because there is a finish in, the, in life. And in the spiritual world, too, 
there is a fruit. The finish is Christ like this. Yeah. So, this is what we are going to attack for the next three months. We are going to look at the forces. We are going to look at the agents that God uses. We are going to look at the tools. We are going to see how to build the skills and the disciplines for Christ. You are going to have the opportunity of examining yourself. Don't wait for somebody to come and mark your paper. You have to examine yourself and look at how between yourself and Jesus, the gap. Hmm? Look at the gap between yourself and Jesus. He himself said it in John 14. John. He said, if anyone believes in me, the works I do will you do. And greater works than this, because I'm going to the Father. If you ask anything about me, I will do it. I put it to you, brothers and sisters, that the greatest person you can take hold of in life is Jesus Christ. If you have found him, you have found life. If you have found him, you have found truth. If you have found him, you have found the light of the world. If you have found him, you have found resurrection and life. Even if you live, you will never die. If you die, you will live again. Because you have got the hold of Jesus. And if you have taken Jesus, I want to plead with you. Hold him tightly. Hold him firmly. Fix your eyes upon him. Fix your thoughts upon him. And glue yourself to him in such a way that you don't look left or right until you get home safe. We are going to rise up and pray. I want you to pray and talk to the Lord that this whole business of how Jesus searched for you and found you and took hold of you and the Father predestined that you should be conformed, transformed and formed into that image that it will be real in your life that you will be a practicing Christ-like person at school, at home, in the office, while driving, and you know, everywhere. Yes, that Jesus will be first in your life, in every way. Pray that you will take the promises of God seriously. Yes, those he foreknew, he predestined that they will be conformed to the image of his son. That Jesus will be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Don't frustrate the process. Don't frustrate the process. God wants you to be in the full image of Jesus. Yes. Reject every spirit of plateau and, and, and self satisfaction, complacency. Take hold of the grace of God which has been extended to you. Yes. Be strong in the grace of God. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the grace that is in Christ. We have been for about eight or nine weeks last year. We were studying about faith. Faith in the promises of God. A conviction that what God says you are, you are. And what God says he can do, he can do. God is not a man to lie or the son of man to repent. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not bring it to pass? 
God has said that he wants you to be like Jesus. I want you to put your faith and trust in these promises and cooperate with his Holy Spirit. Yes, that 2019 will be a year for you to grow, to grow, to grow in Christ likeness. By faith, by faith, by faith, says my grace is sufficient for you. You give you a fresh hunger for the Bible, a fresh test, yes, for prayer, for waiting upon him, carry out that, fellowshiping with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, as that he was talking, I can see that the core critical issue is that fierce and passionate and undying commitment to keep pursuing Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We are reminded of the Philippians 3 from verse 12 where Paul says that, brothers, from the 13, I do not consider myself to have yet apprehended or obtain all these things or be perfect but one thing I do I forget everything that is behind and I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus you see we need to cry out to the Lord <coughs> and the fire will never die the fire will never die. That Lord, there will never come a time when I wake up in the morning and I don't want to pray. There will never come a time when I wake up and I'm satisfied with not doing my quiet time. I'm satisfied with going a whole day. I've not read my Bible. I'm satisfied I've not shared the gospel. I'm satisfied I'm not making a disciple. I'm satisfied that my character is not changing. And there will never come a time where we are complacent, where we are dying, we are plateauing. Our commitment has reduced let me cry out to the Lord that God, let the fire never die. 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 Masako Buddha I do not consider myself I have already obtained all these things, but I press on, and I press on, and I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. I press on in prayer, I press on in the word, I press on in character, I press on in evangelism, I press on in ministry, I press on in the sacrament, I press on in fellowship, I press on, 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 I never stop, I never settle, I never cease, I never die, I never win. I press on my shut up. I press on my I press on my I press on my shut up. I press on my shut up. We know there's more that's found in you, and we, and we will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you, we will never settle, and we will never settle for less. Settle and we 
will never settle for us. We know there's more that's found in and we will never settle for less. And we we will never, we will never settle for less. We will never settle. We will never be complacent. We know there's more that's found in settle for less and we will never settle for less we know there's more that's found in you this morning we make a personal commitment we make a personal pledge that by the power of your spirit and by your sustaining grace, we will never settle. We will never be complacent. We will never plateau. The fire will never die. The flame will not wane. We will work stronger and stronger. Every day, we will be renewed. We will be built up into the image of our Lord from one degree of glory to another. We will never settle. We will never settle. No matter what we lay hold of. No matter what you release to us. No matter where we reach. We will never settle. Lord. Help us to continue to press on towards the image of Christ. And even as we dine with you Lord. May this fellowship of your body and of your blood a transformation of our spirits set a fire in our hearts cause our lives to be consumed with an unceasing passion to be like Jesus Amen, Amen. Follow JFK Mensa Ministries on Facebook and YouTube and invite others to listen to his podcast. You can also access some of JFK Mensa's books and keep up with his ministry at www.jfkmensaministries.org. God bless you.